Hi there. This Saturday, I had a pleasant visit from CEO and co-founder of Bella Sinos, Dr. Mohichaya, a startup located in Leipzig, Germany. Um, they're working on 3D printed implants for soft tissues like breast and bone. We had some nice green tea and pastries and chatted about a slew of things from his worldly experiences um, as a resident in four different countries and Game of Thrones, believe it or not, and the joy of reading. But more importantly, we chat a lot about his company, technologies, his vision and ambition for his future, and a little bit of military strategy and history. So here it is. Enjoy. Okay. Hi, Jenny. Good to have you here in my office. Likewise. You are the very first guest that we have on this podcast, actually physically in my office. I am honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me uh, to your place and uh, really... And I'm looking forward to this spot. I've never done that before. Well, not, before. not only you are the first guest, but you're also visiting from Germany. You're not really here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you, mm -hmm. who you are, yes, and then why we're connected. And we're obviously going to talk about your company and your products. Absolutely, yeah. So my, my name is Mohit. Um, initially, I'm from India, as I was born, until I was a teenager. Then, my, then we moved to Australia, last bit of high school. Um, did my um, undergrad there, was working for a few years uh, for Moody's, one of the Wall Street companies. Oh, yeah. Before, I <laughs> before the crash, basically. Was working with them for like three years or so, and then they shut down the office. Um, and then I said, fine, let's do something else. I had a startup um, that did a social media analytics. Like, and Facebook was very new. Well, what year was that? 2009. Or so, oh, eight, okay, nine, yeah, well, right after. Exactly, yeah. Okay. So we did that for a year, that, that went well. And then um, one thing led to another, and I ended up in an IP law firm for like a year or so. Did that, and then. See, I did not know any of this before this interview, I have to say. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is all new information, guys. <laughs> this is all, so you're learning just as Jenny does. <laughs> so, so, no. Um, yeah, and then um, did that for a while, and then I came across um, a researcher, a scientist, mm -hmm. uh, working in the field of tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, and he had a lot of interesting ideas, right, in, in the field of bone, soft tissue, engineering, 3D printing, and he needed somebody who could do like a commercial viability assessment mm -hmm. of the ideas, right? And me having a certain background myself, including engineering background, I thought I could help, basically. So I did that for about six months with him. Mm -hmm. This and is in Australia. This is Australia. Everything yeah. is in Australia. And um, one of the projects that he was working on was on breast reconstruction. Patients using scaffolds, tissue engineering, 3D printing to help survivors of breast cancer, essentially. It's quite close to me because my own grandma, mm -hmm. uh, he, she had breast cancer. And it kind of spoke to me. Yeah. So I said, why don't we do this together? I said, so he offered me a PhD position in his uh, lab to kind of develop the whole thing. Started off with, you know, developing the printer, programming it, using that to make the scaffolding, all of that, and then ultimately animal trials. But I was helping out a lot of other students as well in their projects, just kind of learn all the techniques that you would need mm -hmm. to bring it into the, the clinic and so on. That was 2014 when I finished my PhD. Mm -hmm. And then we said, look, there, there is commercial viability for this um, product. So let's find, let's found a company to kind of support that commercial development. And it took us, it took us a couple of years to find... And the name of the company is... This Bella Seno. <laughs> and the company is Bella Seno, which in Italian means beautiful breasts. I see. That, that makes sense name. now. That makes sense. So we started But calling... why Italian? You're not it's Italian? A... I don't think it's a beautiful language. We just okay. called all of us. So yeah, <laughs> our founding team were full of Germans and you do not <laughs> right. want to have a German name. I guess, <laughs> I guess German German people kind of admiring the beauty of Italian arts yes. and culture. We like to call ourselves, you know, it's German engineering with Italian design. Because we have Italian designers, actually. That's, really. that's pretty appealing. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. If we can find that. 
And we have Japanese machines that are doing it. So. Nice. <laughs> We'll get to that soon. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. So, so you, found, you founded the company in 2014. 15. 15. 15. Exactly. Almost 10 years now. Almost 10 years now. Yeah. But it took us a while to get funding in Australia. It was a bit difficult. It still is difficult for new companies in Australia. So we found a German investor in 2016, who then said, "Fine, of course, I'm happy to invest, but as a condition, you've got to." Set up the company in Germany. Mm-hmm, I see. So I moved to Germany in 2017 and been living there since, basically. That's a lot. I mean, think about that. You made several moves, big moves. Um, the first time you moved from India to Australia when you were a teenager, what motivated that move? Um, a, a lot of things. So my, my father, he, he passed away when I was very young. Um, he was a trauma and orthopedic surgeon. Oh, of, right? did not know that again. <laughs> I think the new information here. <laughs> but, you know, That's I, huge. Exactly, That's right. huge. Yeah. So I, I would help him, right, in in his, um, in his clinic sometimes, like holding people's arms to take x-rays, for example, oh, things wow. like this, right? So I, I kind of, but one of the things that, I, that he noticed in his own career uh, later in his life was how, you know, there is no time really for your families and so on. Like he would work like right. crazy, like seven days a week, yeah. not much holidays and so on. And so towards the latter part of his career, he did an MBA and he wanted to go into like administration of hospitals. And He's so driven. This is like really <laughs> ambitious stuff. Yeah, he was like 40, I think, or 45 or something when he um, started doing that. And then we were discussing, of course, and we said, look, you know, the, you know, the future is in, you know, if you have your own business, you know, then you, you can obviously, you still don't have time for your family, but, you know, you can actually do a bit more in terms of the impact that you can have yeah. in more just the clinic. So entrepreneurship was kind of seeded early on, mm-hmm. but what was that, um, what was the, the, the field in which to do it, right? And we thought biotechnology, biomed engineering, was that burgeoning field that we wanted to get into. And I found actually a course in Australia that I wanted to go to. I was still in high school. I hadn't finished high school. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to get in that university because they offered a double degree in biomed mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, and business development. Well, that's a very good combo. Exactly. It's a great combo. So I said, look, I want to get there. Let, let's make that happen, basically. And which university is that? QUT, the Queensland University of Technology. Oh, yeah. That's in Melbourne, right? Uh, Brisbane. Brisbane, that's Brisbane. right. Yeah, yeah, North. I, I'm North aware North. of them very much so, actually. I think we had a couple uh, speakers uh, who were in Melt Electro Writing. Well, Paul. Paul yes, Paul. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, and they have like a whole PhD. team there. Yeah, he's now in Oregon. Yes, yeah, he, yeah. he moved. Yeah, yeah he, he was, uh, I think he was a postdoc when I started my PhD. I know. In design. It's yeah. like a whole generation. That location generated a lot of entrepreneurs and scientists. They were, I mean, the, that's so a the, good combo because it's, I think it's about the, the, the ecosystem. So the professor where all of us kind of started, Professor Hutmacher, um, he is still very entrepreneurial, mm-hmm. right? So that's one of the key things that he looks for in people that, you know, if you come in, he always gives up that perspective of commercialization. I have another friend who also started a company, um, Nathan, Nathan, he has a cartilage uh, three different cartilage replacement. There are a couple of a couple of companies like that. Which one is this? Nanocon is a new company. Oh wait, yeah, I invest in Nanocon. <laughs> <laughs> You're an investor in I in, am in Nathan Casper's company. Yeah, Nathan Casper. Now the way you you say it, you said it, I mean I would have pronounced his name differently. Yes, oh, of course. Okay. Yeah, Ben. I know the other co-founder, Ben, and he uh, actually is the community manager for Three Heels for a while uh, uh, really? in DC area. Oh, really? no, yeah. cause, cause I did not know that he was also in the same... We were all the same time. Oh my god. Same periods of time. We crossed paths, I think, for a year or so. That's crazy. Yeah, Good surprise. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. I, yeah I that's no idea. I see. Yeah. That, that's a surprise, isn't it? Yeah. Also for me. Um, so yeah, I know Nathan, he was, he was great as, as, a, as a researcher, came back and started the company. So there's a lot of seeds kind of being put in that place. Yeah, and one yeah. of these days I need to write a blog to see who came out of this program or this university or this mentorship? True, true. Yeah. I think it was fine with a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, kind of sidetracked, but I was reading 
listening and reading this book called Power Law, and they were talking about the Fairchild Semiconductor. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the basically all the right. chip industry how it started. Seventy percent of the current chip industry companies coming out of that oh, Fairchild okay. Semiconductor. Right, and I didn't, I didn't DNA. Know that. This is new for me. I, I didn't know. I mean, it makes sense, right? yeah. yeah, but that takes sixty years. That took sixty years. <laughs> that took sixty years. You're right. Yeah. Hopefully, we are. We gotta live in trouble for nine years. <laughs> <old>. <laughs> No, yeah. I mean, I think it makes sense, right? I mean, you've got them, you know, people that you can look up to, like peers who've done that before. You get inspired, kind of as a feedback loop, right? People hear about that yeah. and work in that team, get that knowledge across. And I think a I lot think of chips have to be aligned perfectly. Mm-hmm. You have to have the right people, the right timing, and the location. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it is, it is every, I think I think you're right. Location, it's, it's, I mean, you wouldn't, I think now it's a different story, but back then, Australia wasn't like the, the hotbed of biotechnology, biomedical right. engineering, right? And I think because of groups like this in QUT, then more and more keep popping up in Melbourne, in Sydney, where it really has become now a hotbed of innovation, right? Yeah. People are kind of going there to develop technologies, do their clinical translation. The doctors and the surgeons are very motivated to try something new. Yeah. There are many companies where surgeons are very conservative. So they oh yeah, give me an evidence of 500 patients that I maybe I try in my practice. Mm-hmm. Whereas in that location, yeah, the surgeons themselves are open to new technologies. Yeah. Yes, it's not proven yet, but I can see how this would be safe for my patient. It would benefit my patients, right? So you're right in that place is important. And the mindset of the people, I think, is another thing that is important. Yeah, okay. Well, tell us a little bit about... Um, the your company mm-hmm. uh, the technology exactly what you're producing and when you have innovated right exactly so we um so what we do is are creating scaffolding for regenerating soft tissue mm-hmm. and the primary target at the moment are breast reconstruction patients right that's where we're going to go so as i said my own family history a lot of pay- people have yeah, or well, they know people yeah. who've got breast cancer. Well, now it's, and, it's not just old people disease anymore. Actually, one in eight women in the U.S. will get breast cancer, unfortunately. And we're actually seeing younger population getting breast cancer as well. So. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and typically the way that you reconstruct them are using silicone mm-hmm. implants, or you do a flap, tissue flap, and so on. And silicone implants, they've been around for decades, right? And they've been a very successful um, product in yeah. general. But these days, you know, people realize that the longer they stay inside the body, the longer there are chances of something going wrong. So people are looking for a, a natural replacement of that tissue. Right. Which is, I think in line with the general economy, everybody wants to grow their own food, everyone's going bio. bio. So having natural tissue, it just makes sense for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to have a solution for that. So the, how, the way how our scaffolding works is like how scaffolding works in construction, right? Mm-hmm. So you have you want to make a building, you want to have a framework in place first. So our scaffold acts as a framework for tissue to grow around and then it remodels over the next year or two. And then the polymer gets absorbed by the body. And mm-hmm. then you have at the end just natural form of the breast. So at the moment we've We've treated now 45 patients with mm-hmm. this technology. The, mm-hmm. the the earliest patient was 2020. So just passing four years of follow-up. Um, and we hope to start now a much larger clinical trial to mm-hmm. then bring it to the market. Um, another project that we have that was born out of the, the breast project is for trauma and orthopedics. Yeah. You know, where you can also, the larger the bone defects is, the more difficult it is to kind of heal it not normally, right? So, mm-hmm. so if we could use the same principle of tissue engineering to also help these patients regenerate their bone, yeah, that's another aspect that we are looking into, and we've also um, we've treated now ten patients for that as well. Yeah, I actually so, saw a paper that you guys, um, I guess, supply the scaffold, and they this hospital surgeons they published this paper, and I can share the link with everybody. Um, but I would imagine. Regenerative medicine for breast tissue is going to be different from regenerating bone tissue. Absolutely. But what do you have to do differently for these different scaffolds? It's interesting. So at the core of it, the scaffold is there to get the biology at the right location and keep it in place and stimulate it to grow. Mm -hmm. So for breast reconstruction, the goal is to get soft tissue. Right. Combination of 
adipose tissue and connective tissue with some vascularization inside, right? Yeah. The fat grafting without a scaffold is done also for decades, but right. there's a lot of pressure acting on it. As the more you eject, the more that pressure builds up, and that leads to a lot of loss in that fat. So what the scaffold does is shield the forces acting on that, mm -hmm. and it kind of gives it room. Yeah, there's these little, what I call highways, for mm -hmm. cells to kind of populate the scaffold. Um, so that's how the breast one was. Bone one was interesting because we still do take autograft from the patient, right? This using a rhea mm -hmm. method or from the iliac crest, you harvest the bone and you also insert it inside the bone. Mm -hmm. But more and more research have shown that to get a better bone, you've got to have a softer scaffold. The bone cells, they like to be stressed to a certain extent right. in order to stimulate their growth, which is the opposite of the fat tissue, right? So in designing the bone scaffold, we have to keep in mind that it had to be have certain rigidity, but also flexibility. So as the patient walks, you know, a lot of the forces are transferred to the growing cells. Mm -hmm. That helps. And because we knew how to make a soft feeling, elastic breast scaffold, we could use similar engineering concepts also in the bone. Yeah. And so on. It's the same polymer at the end of the day. It's the same um, 3D printer that, that prints these things. The intended use is capturing of the biology, you know, it's, it's adjunct to uh, tissue grafting. Yeah. So there's a lot of commonalities, but the design, I agree with you, is totally different between the two products. Yeah, and both are extremely complex, just from my perspective. I mean, maybe to you is simple, but I mean, I can imagine there are almost infinite kind of designs that you could use for either. How do you come to the right design? What is your process? It's a good question. So for breast scaffolds, we used um, silicone implants as our starting point. Because mm -hmm. these exist in the market. The surgeons are familiar with what they look like. How will the shape, you know, be formed as you insert that implant? So we took that as a starting point. When we look at the catalog of silicone implants, we just basically took that. There are more complex defects, congenital deformities, for example, where you cannot have a single size or catalog of products. In this case, we take, we make customized mm -hmm. versions of those, right? So these are the ones where you take scans, CT scans, MRI scans, off the chest wall, for example, and you make something that really fits that perfectly. For bone, yes, the, we also starting, so the way the patient, we've treated our whole customized version. So we look at, we talk to the surgeons, we look at the defect, make something that really fits that particular person's anatomy. Mm -hmm. But in the long term, what we want to do is to collect information on what shapes are we, there must be, you know, some shapes that are common for very complex defects on one end of the spectrum, they'll always be customized. But for a lot of patients with smaller defects, more right. defined, you could perhaps have a modular yeah. assembly, right? So maybe you can trim it, maybe you can put them together like puzzle pieces, right. for example. Right. So that's for us a long-term goal. So we want to learn from what we get from these patients, apply that towards their off-the-shelf version. Yeah, you know, I, I think everybody are very excited about personalized medicine and custom-made devices, but I think I learned a little bit last time when we had an implant webinar is that customization doesn't always play out economically because let's say that you provided something very personalized to an individual, but that person got sicker, the bone defect got bigger, mm -hmm. and you produce this expensive yeah. customized device on, that you cannot use. That's very expensive for the entire process. And it doesn't fit. Exactly. Yeah. So you're right. I mean, at the end of the day, the patient rolls in, the surgeon just wants to have something in the shell on the right. cover. They can just open up and slot it in. But you don't want to have friction in that process. You know, okay, fine. Let's now, because then nobody, everyone is busy. Nobody has the time to kind of talk to the, you know, somebody maybe on the other side of the world, helping you design your stuff. And then it takes two, three, four weeks to arrive, the patient has to be coordinated. Please come on this date when the scaffold is going to be ready. There are a lot of friction points. So yes, I agree. There's a lot of patients for whom customization is probably the only way to go. But vast majority of patients, we think off the shelf. Yeah, the way to do it. Yeah, yeah and and that's the way to scale a company products. Um, uh, but that said, you have several other uh, applications, right? So we have brass implant, scaffold. You have bone. And, and you also have something for the chest wall. Exactly. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so this was a, 
it was almost a chance uh, finding. So we were thinking about how do we bring the soft tissue reconstruction scaffold into the market. And just by chance, uh, one of the surgeons we were working with in Australia, he had a patient with a condition called pectus excavatum, which is essentially when, you know, for, for regular people, normal people, your chest wall is flat. But for these patients, it's sunken in. Right. Right. So that causes, at the, in the best case, a cosmetic deformity, in the worst case, breathing problems, exercise problems, and so on, right? So these patients need something for their quality of life, psychological health, something to correct that deformity or in the at the bare minimum camouflage that deformity right so they can go out to a swimming pool to the beach for example and you know not be so conscious of their body yeah so this patient came in 2020 uh, 19 actually 2019. it's all pandemic all, all of your patients came <laughs> during or that's, after the was, pandemic that, that is very hard. interesting that was hard we yes. had to have the other side of the world and we just had to do it. like a lot of companies right you can't stop working just because you know everybody was remote except for the manufacturing team who kind of had to go to the, the printers to print but you're right everything was in the pandemic so this patient came, came to us and she'd done i think 10 or 15 different surgeries to correct that deformity silicon implants you so know, multiple failed about, revisions multiple failed revisions <clears throat> and the surgeon was the same surgeon who helped us in our animal studies mm -hmm. right so he knew about the technology and I was in the country just by chance. He said, what Where, where is this? Australia. Oh, okay. Everything is this Australia until now. And he said, Why don't we try the breast scaffold? But if you flip it the other way around, yeah. so the projection is going in instead of going out, it could actually conceal that deformity. Mm -hmm. And we thought it was a it was a very nice way of translating what we had done into animals up until that point into uh, patients. Patient was was um, it was very nice. She accepted that this is the first ever time something like this is being used, mm -hmm. and so we worked with the surgeon for two or three months in the pandemic setting. Basically, shipped the scaffold across, treated the patients, and it's gone really well. The patient's very happy. Four years on, and then it made us realize that there are other patients like these patients for mm -hmm. whom. Not, they're not a lot of good options. They can get some metal bars inside. Yes, the chair, we so. talked a little bit about this before this podcast, that mm -hmm. it is a brutal procedure to be in. I actually, when I was a medical student, I scrubbed in this 10-hour long surgery, mm -hmm. and I have to personally cut the cartilage in pieces so we can implant this. So yeah. it's brutal. And not to mention, what, 10 different revisions? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this, yeah, yeah, exactly. this particular patient, I agree. She had a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm great. I'm glad that she's not happy. But other patients, right? You don't want to have that same level of um, invasiveness. So if you could have a quote unquote minimally minimal invasive through one cut, right? You insert it in underneath the skin. If that conceals the deformity, that would help a lot of patients. We thought. So then we found more and more cases like this, mm -hmm. and we thought this is an opportunity for nice. us to, right? So. Yeah. Um, so these are done laparoscopically? No, no, no. Oh. Not laparoscopically. You get one incision, but one small. Incision, okay. A small incision, you can fold the scaffold, mm -hmm. right, and you put it in and it kind of unfolds inside. The I insect, see. Right, so you don't need a very large cut. So it's like the same day, I mean, very short, like, very short. procedure or something. Yeah, something like this. I mean, do you do combined with fat grafting? So it can take 60 to 90 minutes, based, depending on how long it takes for the fat grafting. That's the most difficult. Well, do you have a name for this procedure? Well, we call it scaffold guide, <laughs> step regeneration. <laughs> Mohi procedure, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> like the sign of that, it's the sound of that. You know, so, no, exactly. Yeah, so then we found a very nice um, hospital in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, it is, I think, one of Europe's like top places to go to if you have this condition. Okay. Right, so they get referrals from all over the country and also neighboring countries in there. Yeah. So that's that we showed them the, the results of the first patient. They were really happy to be on board and they did the next set of patients. And in Europe, there is a special scheme for custom made devices to be on yes. the market, right? I've heard a lot about that lately. Right. So yeah. we, we were fortunate enough to take advantage of that and be able to actually put it on the market. So these are commercial products. Mm -hmm. So you can buy them. And the advantage is that these are not customized. All customized. Oh customized. Everything is customized. Oh, okay. Take the C T scan of the patient, we model the the, the rib cage and we've something that really fits that patient. The advantage for us is of course data because 
you know, it's the same polymer as the breast product. Yeah. Same manufacturing method, same design almost, just the form right. is a bit different. So from a regulatory point of view, all the safety data that we collect would be also applicable for our next products. It makes nice. people aware of it, right? That look, this is something that's out there. To, for the regular, if you if you're a regulator, right, you've got a product that is novel in many ways. It's a new polymer that had not been used in this way before, although for sutures they use it. For yeah, time, right. We'll go, to, we'll go to biomaterials soon. Right. So let's talk about this yeah. first. Right. So then, I mean, you have a new manufacturing method, 3D yeah. printing, mm -hmm. right? You've got a condition that is not really so common, and you've got an intended use that is, you know, regeneration of tissue. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of new things for these regulators. And if you start with breast, breast has a long history of scandals, basically, right? Yeah. So everyone is very, you know, conservative. Yeah, well, and some bad that. things happen. Uh, I only know part of the story, but apparently in the past, people would free inject silicone material into the breast to augment for augmentation purposes. Mm. And there are some other breast implant in Europe that went badly. I don't Pips, know. The PIP scandal. Yeah, what so is the, that scandal? Just, so just, just take us in, like, update us. Sure, sure. The PIP scandal. So there was a company in France, and typically when you make medical devices, class three, you, you've got to use, you know, medical group, medical grade polymers or right. materials, right? Yeah. This company did not use medical grade; they used I industrial see. grade polymers just to save costs because it's ten times cheaper, right? Oh wow! Them. Yeah, yeah. So they realized that these particular patients that got these implants from the company, they ruptured more frequently, they had more frequent complications. And when they did the investigation, they realized that the material used was not medical grade. Mm -hmm. And that actually led to the formation of the new medical device regulation. Oh, God. That was the, the <laughs> catalyst for okay. change in regulation, right? Yes. So, see, and it's overreaction, I would say. There's an overreaction, exactly. Yeah. So we kind of wanted to stay away from that. Let them, you know, in kind of like a sandbox setting, evaluate. Mm -hmm. the new product, right? So Pectus gave us that opportunity. The same team yeah. that would review the breast is the one that approved the Pectus Excavator, made them familiar mm -hmm. with the product, with the team especially. And now the idea is that, you know, we keep them updated almost every six months. We show them what we've done. And the hope is that when the breast product is ready for market approval, then these uh, we have a lot more data from the real world mm -hmm. to kind of augment that application. Um, now, a couple of things I have questions. Um, one is to just go back to the Pectus case. Um, you, are you essentially generating a bone defect along the sternum, or what, what does this scalpel mm -hmm. actually do? Right. So it's not it's not a bone reconstruction. It's still soft tissue at the end of the day. Oh, okay. Right. So what happens is that you know you you kind of create space. Basically, mm -hmm. you create a pocket, and then in the pocket goes the scaffold. And the scaffold gets combined with fat tissue, so mm -hmm. from just liposuction. I see. So no, so the bone is, but the bone deformity is not going to be changed. So it's it's a camouflage procedure. I see. Essentially, right? It's not a correction. I see. Procedure for the correction to happen, you've got to change the anatomy of the bone. Right. And this is much more invasive. So there are patients who are perfect for this scaffold guided I see. regeneration. So it's like minor. Probably minor uh, pectus. Minor and minor. So there's there's different like levels right. of pectus one, two, three, four. Yeah. The 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 most problematic one is where you have breathing difficulties. Breathing problems. There you cannot use a scaffold because right. it's just too. It's not going to fix that problem, right. Right? right? Or you have on the other end of the spectrum just very minor defects you can fix with like a vacuum therapy or something. Right. It's the middle bit where the defect is still kind of obvious that the patient is feeling insecure, right. but not so bad that they have any exercise or breathing problems and so on. Right. So it's this particular slice of patient that we target. right? So they don't, it's, it wouldn't be recommended for them to go through this very arduous you know, procedure that, that you described before, mm -hmm. but vacuum wouldn't work for these. So it's this middle bit that we target. Great. Um, I mentioned that we, I want to talk a little bit about the biomaterials. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I've heard of the bioabsorbable or resorbable sutures. Actually, uh, we actually invited speakers to talk about these materials in the past. And PCL is certainly a material that we encounter quite often in 3D printing, so, mm -hmm. uh, 3D printing space. I just can't, I mean, I can imagine a suture get, get reabsorbed. It's so small and thin. 
I cannot imagine the scaffold, which is a giant block of plastic, essentially, to get reabsorbed. Yeah, I mean, the, so a couple of things that led to our choice of PCL. Yeah. One is, you mentioned the long history of it, right? A lot of surgeons are used to the idea of using PCL as molecule sutures. Right? That's one less thing for us to worry about. It's a safety profile. You know, there's the supply chain around it, right? It's, it's all set. There's nothing for us to do. The other thing is it's, it's easier to work with in many 3D printers because, you know, it, you can heat it up for long periods of time without, you know, degradation in the properties of the material. But most importantly, it degrades slowly. That for us is an in, important feature. It's actually good. It's actually good for us mm -hmm. because um, what we saw is that in animals, you put it into the animal, within a month or two, you do get tissue. But this is not the final tissue that is in there, right? You've got to let it remodel a couple of times inside the body, let it mature, stabilize, and then the scaffold should start degrading. So it's not a curve that goes like this, tissue goes up, scaffold goes down, mm -hmm. but it's more, you've got to wait for that. And there is a substantial amount of material that you're putting in. Like we put in, depending on the size, between 15 and 25 grams of polymer into yeah. each patient, right? right? And if there is very fast degradation, there is a risk that you get a late stage, late stage inflammation from the degradation byproducts that come out of it. Right. Raises the pH of the environment, mm -hmm. leads to problems for the patient. Right. So we want to have a very small... Probably symptoms, I would, I would think. Right, exactly. Right. So we haven't seen any of our patients these late stage problems out up to four years follow up. Most of them are getting to up to two years follow up. So that was the reason why we went to that because we wanted to degrade slowly. Mm -hmm. You know, the important thing is the patient should not be able to feel the rigidity of the scaffold. So what we, in our trials, for the breast patients now, mm -hmm. yeah, right? So in the first two months, the patients do feel the scaffold. They're not bothered by it, but they can feel that, yes, it's, it's there, I'm fine with it. But when it comes to six to 12 months time frame, the scaffold softens up because the mechanical properties would start degrading mm -hmm. of the PCL at, mm -hmm. that, at that point in time. Yeah. And then they they can't feel it anymore. They, the volume is there. You can see from the MRI that there's, there's tissue, but it feels just like natural tissue for them. So they almost forget that there is an implant inside, which is for us always the perfect uh, right. feeling to have. Yeah. But if it's going to take after that point in time, two years, three, four years, as long as the patient doesn't have complications, we would rather have a longer tail of, re of degradation. Mm -hmm. As long as it doesn't bother the patients, right? Then have a shorter degradation time frame, leading to more inflammatory reaction. Yeah. And how do you monitor these patients? Because, you know, we actually, you know, I've been referring to another implant event that we hosted on metal. Mm -hmm. Those have, patients sometimes can have some something called metallosis, whereas you have like, you can detect metal particles, right, particles, particles yes. in, in the blood. Like, what are your ways of monitoring your patients? Um, there, we have to go for as much as possible non-invasive ways of monitoring this patient. Right? Because if there is no problem, it's ethically very difficult to get invasiveness in there. So the primary way that we follow them is through what we call a patient satisfaction. That's like so for all implants, including breast implants, the silicone and our implants, there are standardized scales that the patients, mm -hmm. in terms of their psychological health, you know, satisfaction with breasts, phys physiological health, you know, they, they all follow that through to the same questionnaire, essentially, mm -hmm. right? So that's the primary way of that we assess. Um, that's a more subjective way. Right? It is subjective. If you think about it, um, a lot of these patients, um, you know, they're getting you to improve the quality of life. Right. That is the goal of the product is to improve QOL. So that should be quite high on our list that, okay, if it's not improving the quality of life, what's the point of getting a scaffold, right? And that we do it through these scales. Obviously, we do MRI. We do a lot of MRI scanning on these. We do contrast Does it show up well on MRIs? Um, it so does. the radiologists are just curious. No, no, it does. I mean, you can really see that in the initial stages, where there's a little bit more liquid in the system just after implantation, right. converting that into tissue, which is fatty mm -hmm. and has other soft tissue vascularizing. You can really see, you can even see blood vessels going in if you do contrast yeah, right. MRI. They are large enough that they can kind of, you can see them penetrate that's into the amazing. scaffold. Like, yeah, yeah, that's that's amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're going to publish these results um, yeah. of this year. Um, but this, that's actually quite good. From MRI, you can see it really well. 
Uh, and how well do you see your implants? So you, you can monitor, can you monitor your implant degradation over time with imaging? It's a very good question. Degradation, yes and no. So in the early stages, it's very clear where the implant is. Right? You can see the structure, right. but as it gets degrading, it becomes a bit more homogenous, the whole system. Right. You can still see here's where kind of okay in the middle, but the boundaries become blurry right. between the healthy tissue and the scaffolding. I don't think you can ever tell if there is, from MRI alone, yeah. that is all of the PCL gone, is some of the PCL gone. Mm -hmm. I think it's difficult unless you take a biopsy of the patient. What about the other imaging modalities like CT or ultrasound even? Ultrasound, we tried ultrasound. Uh -huh. um, if it's closer to the skin, you can see something. Right. Yeah. These are so deep inside the patient's view. Right. Even Doppler, which I Doppler ultrasound didn't really work. The best is MRI. We will now start mammographies as well to make sure that you know it doesn't um, interfere with mammographic um, screening. But degradation of of the PCL, implant itself? No, the whole patient, of course. So right, right. I mean, I can't imagine squeeze the implant like that um, on an, the mammography machine. That's that's going to be uh, but bad for the that. implant, right? Well, we test that with the implant. So the implant or the scaffolding before it goes in. It goes through all these testing, which simula simulates a mammography, simulates a surgeon folding it like a cigar. And it's it enough to yeah, sustain all these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We test them for up to 20 cycles, okay. basically. And it has to be, right? Because the key thing is a surgeon should not have to change his practice to fit the scaffold. The scaffold must fit the surgeon. See, the surgeon is used to placing it through a certain sized incision. Right. Then the scaffold must fit that. Right. But right. in the workflow, that's the workflow, critical. Right. It's very yeah. critical. Like you don't just just because it's new technology doesn't mean the surgeon should change what they've been doing for the last twenty years. Um, fat grafting. So we also test how does a needle penetrate through the scaffold? Does that lead to defects in the scaffold or not? All of that is tested, and mammography is is one of them. Right. You don't want to have a, a situation where. The, the patient, yes, is happy to get a scaffold, but it interferes with the cancer screening. Right. That is really bad, right? So we've uh, the scaffold can so be So I, I mean, I'm not a mammographer, but I do think existing implants kind of limit the value of mammography, actually. They do, they do. I mean, there are techniques you can use, like displacement techniques. Yeah. Push it out it's, of the it's, it's, not, it's, a, it's very manual yeah. and yeah. labor intensive and not very good. But, yeah, I, I don't have the answer if ours would be any better or not. I need that would be an interesting answer to have though. Yeah, and we want to get that answer, right? Because right. I mean, this is an important thing that everybody wants to see before it goes to like the broader market. Yeah. And we are really committed to kind of testing that, to making sure that it does show up. Yeah, um, I think, you know, I, Mohit actually submitted a written interview with um, for our upcoming virtual event. Um, and you mentioned something that's very interesting is about how you create an ecosystem within the company for design manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Can you just explain to us how did you set that system up? That includes your own software, your own hardware, um, and your supply chain, may maybe, and and your man manufacturing process. Like, you just give us a little bit overview of. I, I feel like it's pretty unique because I, because usually I don't see um, medical device companies set up the whole yeah. process. We didn't want to do it. I mean, initially, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's expensive. Be, right? I would it's say it's expensive. very expensive. Like, if you look at our burn rate, right? The right. clinical one is the biggest burn rate. Right. Operations is another. So. Initially, the idea was that we would find a contract manufacturer right. who would do the design, produce it for us, and we would just be able to do the trials, and it's on the market, they would produce it for us. None of them existed that could do it the way we wanted them to do it, right? Okay, fine, then we said, let's buy a 3D printer. Mm -hmm. We can just buy, put it up there on the shelf, and just click print, it just does the job. Yeah. We, we saw, we, we tried a lot of printers, <laughs> expensive, like $100,000, $200,000 per printer. And these are all extrusion based. Extrusion, yeah, we had to go with extrusion because in my view, it's the safest way of producing an implant. When you have life based curing, you always add things into the polymer mix that you don't know what the carcinogenicity of that is in the long term. Yeah, I don't really know if there are any re uh, bioabsorbable resin. People are working on it. So my um, supervisor of my, one of the other supervisors of my PhD thesis mm -hmm. worked on something using okay. PCL. And stereolithography. Yeah, that would be amazing. It is possible, but you always add these, um, you know, these cross-linking agents and the toxicity of that. 
that's the why question. Right. Exactly. That's exclusion based is the way you want to go. And you know, we didn't want to use um, these filament based exclusions because mm -hmm. it's too expensive right, to buy this filament. Mm -hmm. Going back to what I said before, silicone implants are a very commercially successful product, partly yes. because of the cost. Uh -huh. They cost like, what, $50 to make, $80 to make one implant, right? Wow, their margin is like, what, 90%? It's good. That's yeah, it's not that the margin. It's very good margin. Depends on which country, because different countries have different selling prices. Right. US is the highest. Right. They're always the highest. <laughs> That's right. So. <laughs> not just, it's so, sad. <laughs> but if, 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 so we couldn't come up with a solution that costs 10 times as much. Mm -hmm. Like we have to compete with that on pricing as well at some at some point in time. Right. Right. So flakes or pellets that what we call they are the first output from the supplier, right? So it's gonna be always the cheapest that you can buy. So we said let's go with that. So we have a reservoir, mm -hmm. put the pellets in, get smelted, extruded through. Mm -hmm. And these printers, they call themselves these bio printers, right? There's a lot of companies out there in Switzerland and Germany. There are all kinds of bio printers out there. So, of, exactly. yeah. so yeah, yeah, that's what we use because that's okay. the one that could take the pellets and then extrude them through. Do you mind sharing us what printer exactly the brand? Yeah, I mean, they. let me start by saying it's a great company. Like, okay. you know, it's just for our application didn't fit, but you can really amazing engineers. The company is called Gizim. G E S I M based out of Preston, very high precision, I've high heard quality, about them. yeah, amazing people. Like, they manufacture other things too, because I feel like they're like a conglomerate, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do. I mean, anything to do with semiconductors and so on, they do basically. Yeah, like, they do. I think like exactly like pick and place robots, a lot of things. I mean, I mm -hmm. actually forgot about their offering to like right now, but for a bioprinter, it worked like a workhorse, you know, it was working day in, day out, five years. And it works. Works Not, amazingly doesn't, doesn't well. break down. Doesn't break down. And what about customer service? Is good customer service? Customer service, I mean, for us, it was good because they were right next door, right, to us. Like, they were in Dresden, yeah. which is like 100 kids from us, and we are in Leipzig. Well, I don't know about other, other locations, but for us, it worked really well. Loved the printer. Mm -hmm. The only issue with it was it was too slow. For our needs, right? Yeah. So we had very large implants, right? right? And we had to make a lot of them. So it took like eight hours or so. One implant. Oh, that's <laughs> not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, obviously for the company, we were not the target market. Right? It's mostly done for researchers in right. universities and so on who do not have such a high throughput requirements. So, but nonetheless, we did some advertising for them. Just to yes, them. exactly. He's in great, <laughs> I mean, great printer, guys. If you are thinking of a printer, they, they have good yeah, solutions. Yeah, for research purposes. Research purposes, okay. great solutions. Or a small prototype or a prototype. simple project. That would help us, right, in the first yeah. year of the company. Eight hours, that's it. If you can afford that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Go for it. Great yeah. printer. Love it. Okay, them. and then now you moved on to next. Moved on to, we had to build our own. That was the best. Oh, oh. Okay. Nothing better. I would say. So we made a custom extruder. Okay. using two rotations. We worked with a Japanese company, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's a small Japanese company. And they were making extruders for cell phone manufacturing. You know, when you have a cell phone, you want to glue your screen on it. You, know, you need to have exclusion. Like you're oh, right? yeah. What are the what are other industries that need exclusion? How do they solve these problems, right? So we brought them into our um, way. We kind of told them how should they be making a extruder that fits 3D printing purposes. And we are the only customer that uses for 3D printing. They think mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're, they're, it's a cool application, but they will never get into 3D printing. What's the name of this company, if you don't mind? So this, so this company is called Technia. Okay. Basically, Technical Diamonds is okay. uh, that small Technia. Also, a great company advertising for <laughs> Technia a little bit as well. Yeah. They also made printers for the Wake Forest Institute mm. a while back. So they knew about how they made the extrusion it. tip, basically. Or they made the tip. So tip is what they typically make, but also the whole extruder thing. I see. As well, right? So, so we had a good collaboration with them, um, and then we just put that. Exuder onto our platform, mm -hmm. essentially, right? The movement, which is just off the shelf, you can buy from anybody, from Bosch or whoever, right? Um, and then that became our printer. So we then qualified it, we did all the biocompatibility testing around it, mm -hmm. certified it for production of class three devices. Oh, wow. We can now print the scaffolds in like 15, 20 minutes, basically. Wow. That was a huge achievement. Yeah. 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 So it was pretty, pretty And cool. how long did that take you guys to figure it out? 
we had we had, we had a very good team, honestly. Um, it took us around a year or so. Okay. Um, because also in my PhD, we did work with screw base extruders, so I knew kind of how it worked. But we had great engineers who had done that before in their PhDs as well. And they helped us basically. The whole team came together mm-hmm. to build that because without that, the company couldn't move forward, right? Yeah. So we had to kind of fix that problem. Um, and this is a pellet. Um, pellet. Okay. okay. Pellet. And nobody else can basically make the same thing because they don't have your machine. Well, I mean, if, well, they could build their own extruders, of course. Um, and I'm sure there are companies out there in the future who would replicate this. But I think as far as we know, we are the only ones that can do it at this precision and at this speed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we never know. We might come up with a business ourselves. That no, no, please, please do not sell your machine. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that, that model. <laughs> No, no, no. But I mean, then came the software, right? So, yeah. Because we had to, it doesn't work with G-code like other machines, right? It works with other formats. And we had to find a way to create our own structures, like a slicer. Right. Like, if you get a slicer, there are pre-built infill patterns, essentially, right? That you can choose one of them. Mm-hmm. Our pattern, we came up with our own. So there was no way you could use a conventional slicer to make the G-code. We build our own slicer, right? Mm-hmm. So we get the, is this preparatory? Is this part of your IP system? Part of our how do you manage it? Yeah, yeah. No, we've got patterns on the algorithms and things like this. How do you make this? For both breast and bone, mm-hmm. right? So this is all part of our IP. And now that we have the whole thing, right, we can go very seamless from, okay, we use the standard software to reconstruct the MRI to kind of get the 3D model out of it. Mm-hmm. But from that point on, it's all our system, all the way through to the printing. And then it goes for sterilization and things like this, right? So it helps us control the quality um, as well. And it helps us get you know, properties out of PCL that people thought were impossible. Yeah. Like soft, elastomeric, rubbery, almost feel for the breast, but having rigid but still flexible bones. Yes. And this yes. is all by design, the lattice, in, 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 a, in a way, much, right? Pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. Because yeah, that's the thing. We are an engineering company, right? We, of course, the products that we do are for regenerative medicine. We don't see ourselves as material. There's two ways you can do it. Either you can invent a new polymer mm-hmm. that has that properties built in. Right. Or you can use an existing polymer that has the right safety profile and use innovative and engineering techniques to make the right properties that you want to have. Mm-hmm. We chose the second path because we said, look, you know, patient safety is number one. We want right. to use char- well-characterized materials and we have to do the work, right, as engineers to get the properties that we want to have. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Mm-hmm. And uh, so now you only have one manufacturing facility that's certified or exactly. do you have several different ones? Uh, we have one that's certified in Leipzig, uh-huh. uh, East of Germany. And that's about one hour from Berlin, you said. One hour from Berlin, exactly. Um, it's Never uh, heard of this city before. It is, oh, it historically it's been, um, I mean, it was founded in the Roman times, was a market city. Okay. It was an intersection of Via Imperia and Via Regia, so it was a very important city back for trading. And it, it was, even within Germany, um, before the war, was a, a flourishing, you know, uh, trade, trade fairs and trade markets. Then became part of the Eastern Germany after mm-hmm. the, the wall. Right, I remember you saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the priorities <laughs> changed for a number of years. And in the 90s, the wall fell down, became part of the West Germany. And then now the government wants to make it as a hub for biotechnology, biomedical industries. So there's a lot of incentives to mm-hmm. companies to go, there, especially in the biotech sector. So, you know, it's been coming out, it's coming out a lot. It's, it's a nice city, um, and that's where our plant is. And But we are, uh, we recently got um, funded by the Australian government oh. um, to set up another plant in Australia. Great. So yeah, the same site mm-hmm. where we are doing the clinical trials is where we would have a, a bigger plant um, as well that would be ready by the time we need it. So we don't need a, like tens of thousands of scaffolds now. Mm-hmm but we would need them in three, four years' time when it's really on the market. Mm-hmm. And when that's ready, the new facility would be ready as well. So that would be the the next. Um, and then the good thing about the printers, like any other printer, they're mobile units, right? You can put them anywhere you want. Basically, you can put them in, say, in San Francisco. You can put them in Berlin. You can put, you can put them in my Berlin. office. 
and put them in here. Okay? <laughs> I don't think like one, one, one meter by one meter. Essentially. But you have to have some kind of uh, you know regulatory like well, yeah, like you have to have a GMP or something. You know, manufacturing. Yeah, GMP. Um, you've got to qualify the machinery absolutely. So. The, the so you wouldn't qualify my office because I need to have a sterile environment. I think with the right incentive, anything can be qualified. <laughs> a nice logo, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you can. I mean, you need to have a clean room, essentially, right? So the clean room that has certain standards of air purity. Yeah. That's the most important. Thing. It's pretty expensive to set up those. Yeah, we had to build our own. Yeah, yeah. So we built our own clean rooms in COVID times. Again, um, has, has to do. We, yeah. we were lucky because we learned a lot from a research institute that we collaborated with early on called the Fraunhofer okay. Institute, another advertisement for you guys. Where, where is this institute? In Leipzig, right next to our Oh, office. okay. Is it, is it a scientific research institute? It's scientific, but also commercial. Commercially okay. driven translational research. I That's see. what they do. And in Leipzig is, I think, one of the best GMP facilities in Europe. Oh. Actually, yeah, yeah, because you know, like the Kimra, the you know the the CAR T cell therapy mm -hmm, yeah. was first being manufactured over there. Did not know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the the team there is world class in terms of GMP manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky enough to work with them, and they when we kind of rented their clean rooms for a while, we worked on a joint project by the government that helped us kind of learn the ropes of how do you work. In the clean rooms and how do you qualify machines, how do you certify machines. And from there we took that knowledge into our own clean room. At the end of that project, um, we build our own, but all of the procedures that we have are somehow inspired or derived from what we learn in that institute. So we are we talked about community and location before. Yeah. This is one of the tangible benefits. Yeah, I mean I I know quite a few startups could totally benefit from this kind of location, but you know it, it is Leipzig, yes. Yeah, I don't know about, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Um uh, but now I would imagine some of the the servers would demand the implants in a more timely fashion. You know, you can't just like say, oh, wait for two months for your implant. That's How, do you have this kind of request now? Now, now you're getting to trauma and orthopedia. All the time. Okay. All the time. So that's why long term is going to be off the shelf. You don't want to stay in customized forever. Forever, yeah. So we wanted to learn and then now, even now, right, then it comes a supply chain issue. If you have got metal implants, you can produce it yourself, ship it to the hospital, they can sterilize it. Right, uh, during right. autoclave, for yeah. example. Now, PCL implants, they right. don't, they can't not going to sustain right? that. Right, yeah. so our bottleneck is in the packaging and sterilization mm -hmm. at the moment, right? Yes. That's take a couple of weeks because we're not a huge company, right? So we are at the bottom of the priority list yeah. in terms of, right? So what we are now starting to do is to work with smaller um, sterilization supplies with the right certifications mm -hmm. and the quality but where we would have the same level of care as the other um, bigger companies, right? So this is how we are kind of bringing down the, the lead time from, you know, at the moment, three weeks or so to a week or two weeks or so, right? Because it's, it's not time consuming, it's because you want to run, because we, we use um, gamma radiation to sterilize it, right? I see. And I they, was wondering what you use. Gamma. Okay. And the supplier wouldn't just start the machine for hours, right? They right. wait until the whole, chamber is full. Yeah. So that's where the lead time comes from. Right. So if you have smaller machines, you need fewer products to fill that right. chamber. Right. So smaller companies are what we have started to work with to bring down that supply chain um, issue. There's a lot of automation that we do, of course, on our side as much as possible. It is a customized implant, so you can't automate everything. Mm -hmm. But there's some things in the workflow that you can do such as even things like documentation and so on, right? Because it's the same documentation you make for every single patient. So if the designer has to do a lot of paperwork, if you automate that process, that helps, that takes away like 30% of the workload, Yeah. for example, right? If you make sure that the, the design that you make on the computer is going to work on the printer, if you get that confidence that you reduce your failure rate, for example, all of those steps reduce the lead time. But the and there are a lot of steps involved, actually. There are a lot of steps involved, yeah. uh, including communication with surgeons. So our team is ready, for example, the surgeons away on holidays or conferences and so on. 
you just have to wait because they have you to, have to go into the operating room with them yeah, yeah absolutely all of our i mean that we put a very high premium on any team member in the design team to be part of that so we have a an excellent chief medical officer mm -hmm. who is a trauma surgeon himself nice right so he is obviously the customer at the end of the day right right and he's the one that leads our design teams right so as a lot of companies you know it's kind of counterintuitive to have a surgeon lead design team. It works for us because that means fewer communication cycles with the other surgeon because he can kind of predict what they would want, right? So that all, all of that kind of helps streamline the process, but these are not long-term solutions. I mean, we can get it to a certain level, mm -hmm. but as you scale, the problem kind of compounds, right? So that's when we want to have long-term, off-the-shelf, ready to go, patient comes in, open the drawer, Here's the implant. Here's but if you want customized, you can still do it. You still yeah, have absolutely. that option. We have that option, and there will always be a customized version yeah. of our scan yeah, for those patients that really, really need it. So now we have a couple of minutes left. Um, I know you, can, you know, you're a uh, world traveler. You, you're obviously here in San Francisco yeah. mm -hmm. for business. Um, I, I like to know, you know, the entrepreneur environment in all these countries you've been to. You've been, you lived in. Holland or Netherlands, mm. ne Netherlands, Netherlands, sorry. Yes, Netherlands yes. <laughs> and uh, obviously Australia, uh, India. I don't know how much you know about childhood. that. Childhood, yeah, yeah, childhood, childhood. Mm. and um, Germany now, and now you're looking into the U.S. as well. I mean, do you have a comparison on how you feel about the advantage and disadvantage of some of the systems here I and think elsewhere? It's a good question. Every country, I think, has something to teach you. Yeah. So there's mindset is so different. So going from India to Australia was a big jump, basically in terms of thinking about things. Indian education system is is great, but it's well, at the time when I studied, yeah, it was still influenced a lot by hundreds of years ago when we were still part of the British colonies, right? And the edu the the emphasis was on not really questioning your teachers, learning what you're given, basically yeah. memorizing a lot of stuff, yeah. right? Which made you really good at memorizing. Things. That's like Chinese. <laughs> I think the same. I think they're yes. the same, right? So not creativity based. Not a lot of creativity yeah. based, exactly. Yeah. You gotta follow the system, right? Yeah. But you get really good at focusing, right? You work under pressure. That that's what they teach you, right? Like competition is fierce. It's fierce, right? Like I would have six days in a week. School seventh day was the test, the weekly test on Sunday. <laughs> nice. <laughs> You're well tested. So it, it kind of like toughens you a little bit. Yeah. In terms sure. of the future what's yeah, coming definitely. towards you, right? It's not yeah. an easy place to live by then. So then you go to Australia, which is very much creativity initiative. Yeah. You no, know, you can't question anyone that you want. You've got to think critically, logically. So then I had to change my thinking to fit yeah. that environment. And the Australians are, like I said, they're very innovation driven. They like new things. Mm -hmm. um, they don't care so much about all of the problems that can happen downstream when starting a project. For sure. Let's get started. If the relationship works out, we'll yeah. find solutions to the problems. But let's get moving, right? Let's, yeah. let's, so let's they're more about just do it. Just do it. Attitude. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Then I moved to Germany, which is I have a little bit of an opposite mindset, where if you work with Germans, they really want to make sure all of the downstream problems yeah. are thought through yeah. in advance of the project. So before you sit down, you really like sit down and think about, let's find out all the ways this could go wrong, this could not work, and then fix that or have strategies for mitigating them. So it takes a bit longer. Very risk averse. Very risk averse, yes. So it's great for incremental innovations. Yeah. Right? Where you can kind of foresee the problem. Right. Incremental. Incremental exactly. innovations, right? Sorry. So well, well put. Yeah. Yeah. So radical new ideas, a bit more difficult, right? Because you can't predict what the problems are going to be like, right? So, but as somebody who's moved from Australia to Germany, you can then start putting these two things together. Yeah. Right. In areas where it's incremental innovation, you use a German method, right? Let's use it down. In other ways, we use more the Australian way, or let's just do it. The no. cowboy way. The cowboy. <laughs> US, I haven't lived here. I don't know what it's like. Yeah. I guess it's a mixture of. I think there's a difference between East Coast, West Coast, for sure. Okay. Yeah. But I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on the, the American way of doing things. 
Um, it's hard to summarize, um, but I would say I, I'm going through a book right now. I, I highly recommend it. Um, I actually read it before, but I'm rereading it. It's called The Power Law. Okay. It talks about the history of venture capital mm. and why Silicon Valley it is today. Okay. Uh, why it didn't happen in Boston, where Harvard, MIT, and the DOD are located. Okay. Um, I mean, there's some theory behind it, but the West Coast, East Coast innovation attitude and you know how how company were formed and fundraising i definitely know that difference for sure yeah. since we have a pitch 3d program and uh we know how hard it is to raise institutional money on the east coast for example okay. when you're early yeah. early mm -hmm. stage starting the risk is a lot higher mm -hmm. than say you know when you're b or c stage mm -hmm. um on the west coast it's definitely, you know, if you're like working on something in a garage, you know, I may actually put in some money <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, there's definitely a little bit of gambling attitude, definitely a little bit like no risk, no return. And even if the risk outpays the return, people are still willing to do it, that kind of attitude. Sure. I, I mean, we don't get me wrong. We have a lot more um, extremely intelligent investors than me. I'm, I'm just an Android investor. Um, but but the attitude is is definitely a lot more adventurous and um more like um optimistic okay and less you know fear-based and conservative mm, okay. um yeah, yeah. It, it, it is there's you can see the attitude difference between mm -hmm. the west and the east I, I would say that that's the only thing i know right now i'm still learning myself mm -hmm. yeah that's an that interesting perspective right if you're depending on which stage you are, then you can kind of pick, okay, maybe what is right for me, is it the West Coast, the East Coast? Yeah, I also have another theory, yeah. also based on my experience in China and in Chinese exactly. venture capital and startups. My theory in general is the further away you're from the capital city of the country, the better you're more, the more innovative you the are. The more innovative Yeah, you're out of control. Okay, you're like the wild, wild west, okay? If you're in Shenzhen and Hong Kong and that more southern part of Mm. And the more south you go from okay. Beijing, the better it is. The better it is. That's interesting. Yeah. And as I would say you can translate that into America. It's like the further away you're from DC, the better it is. I see. That's I my see. theory. I don't know. I well, we'll see. We'll do some research and, and see if that theory really pans out. It's yeah. a theory. It's not a law. It's probably interesting to look at it. I mean, look, at the end of the day, right, you have always, I think in Australia to a lot of extent, but also in, in the US, you have this frontier mentality. Right when, yes. like if you look at the history of the US, Australia, a lot of these countries, you know, Australia yeah. was made by criminals, if you don't know about that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there were in the niche, but then, then came the settlers, right? right? And yes, okay, there were a lot of. They're definitely rule breakers. I rule say. breakers, okay, okay. <laughs> law breakers, even. Law breakers, I have to get it out of the way that okay. Native Americans yeah. and Native Australians, yeah, they got. A really bad, right. badly treated, yes. Bad deal. But bad deal and so on. But okay, if you look at it from the settler's perspective, right? Right. You come in and then you've got this wilderness. The government says, here's your plot of land. There might be wild animals. There's no one to help you. Yeah. There's no support systems, right? Yeah. You can't call the police if they <laughs> like bandits come in and rob you, right? Right. So you come up with this mindset of taking risks. Yeah, right. and then I guess that's what you are seeing in countries like Australia and maybe the U.S., maybe even more California, which was settled a little bit later than um, the East Coast, right? Where this mentality maybe kind of permeates into the present, mm -hmm. into the way people think about risk and reward. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you have no other options, but success. But succeed, Su right? Yeah, success is your only option. You're going to work as hard as you can and try to find a group of people who can actually share the same mentality and survive together that's it yeah mm -hmm. and and uh, also in the same written interview interestingly you talked about a book that you recently read and i'd love to hear why don't you share a little bit about that absolutely well. so the book is called alexander the great and the logistics of the macedonian army mm -hmm. so it's, it's a dry read it's more academic than like uh, interesting reading but what i like about it is that everyone talks about alexander the great how he was born grand ambitions, grand strategies, you want to conquer the world. Yeah. 
No one talks about the nuts and the bolts of how he made it happen. Yeah. Why was everyone okay? If you were in the in the classical era in Greece, you wanted to go into Persia. There's only certain routes that you could take along the coast where your supply lines, your ships would come in and supply them. Along routes where you know there's going to be villages where you can gather supplies from, because you can't carry all of your food all the way from Greece into the Persia. You've got to have local people kind of take it from them, essentially. Right? Yeah. And um, then the book talks about how do you carry that amount of resources, right? You've got maybe pack animals that you know you can, like maybe donkeys or horses, which can take all the food with you. Mm -hmm. How many tons of food do you need? How do you do? Laundry for all these people, right? How do you basically? It's laundry? Kind of, yeah, such a thing. they have to, right? I'm not sure. You can't wear the same clothes for like eight years. It can't be for eight years That's long, true. right? Then you've got families to think about. Right. right? Like soldiers, they were married, they had kids. Right. Should you make a decision to bring, allow them to bring families that double the size of your, they can't help you forage, but they consume food, they consume resources. Yes. Right? So the beauty of Alexander's generals was that they were very disciplined. No camp followers, what they called. So no families. It was tough for the soldiers, but it made them very mobile. So no carts, basically, which could carry more food. The soldiers had to carry their own food on their bodies, basically, which made them very mobile in terms of where they could go, how fast they could move. So there were, if rules of thumbs were, if you're the enemy, you're going to come down this road. There's only one way. There's no, you can't just make your own way, right? There's only yeah. one pass you can right. come going to take you a month to get here, yeah. I can take my time. But no, these guys were much faster, they were much more mobile, they didn't have all these followers with them, and they calculated down to like the last ton, how much grain they need to carry, mm -hmm. right? How much water they need to carry, how much meat they should carry. And then they kind of used that in their strategy, right? And look, at, I can get there faster than the enemy, I can get a much better advantageous position if I can move faster, more nimbly, I can respond to these kind of attacks, right? So there's a lot of math involved. Yeah. Like how many, because like your supply lines sometimes are 30, 40 kilometers long, right? All of your retinue, because you can only walk in a single double fire on this long road. Yeah. So you're at a camp. The next camp is, say, 20 kilometers away, because you can only walk 20 kilometers a day. So even if your supply line is 30 kilometers long, by the time the first car gets to the second camp, the last one hasn't even started growing from the first camp, right? Yeah. So all of these logistics that no one thinks about when planning these grand campaigns, and this will kind of shed some light on it, because I think there's parallels to how you can build a business. Yeah, right? sure. Because you can say, I want to do this, that's my vision, which is great, that's the starting point. But you've got to find a way to execute on mm -hmm. that, right? There's all these little details. You have to be very detailed. Very meticulous. Oriented. Exactly. Very meticulous, and that's where the difference comes in execution. If you're nimble, if you're able to kind of change your tactics midway, just like Alexander did, yeah, that gives you an edge, right? So, what motivates to find this dry book to read? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of I was reading a blog. Um, I was actually reading a blog. You're right. It's called um, a collection of unmitigated pedantry. Right. Okay, that sounds like a dry blog. <laughs> <That's> a dry <laughs> blog. But the, the author there he talks about yeah different ways in which um, militaries organize their structures and so on. I did like military things. So since I was a kid, yeah. playing video games and strategy. And stuff. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I would understand a boy growing up wanting to learn military strategies, but me, I actually just recently started to be more interested in military strategies because I um, heard this really great podcast by Dan Carlin. He talked mm. about the beginning part of Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. And then I went through another podcast, which I re recently recommended. It's called The Founders. And they actually mm. talked about Napoleon, uh, Napoleon, another great military Absolutely. strategist. Mm -hmm. And um, the podcast, I forgot the name of the podcast host, but he's very famous. And he said, you know, a lot of these, like, great politicians in our recent modern history like Churchill mm -hmm. um, they learn about these modern day that they, they generate the strategies based on these older generations yeah. thousands of years ago and almost every great general well, would yeah. actually learn study these the Alexander the Great and Napoleon yeah. very carefully and thoroughly yeah. so I definitely think nowadays we have no warfare we're just thank God hopefully no more um, but I think for company, building companies, and when you have a slew of competitors, when everybody could have a stake in this world, 
of mm-hmm. breast implants and resorbable implants, like you definitely can take a couple pages out of their playbook to apply to your company for sure. Yeah. I, I think you have to read widely as much as you do deeply, right? Because yeah. sometimes you may find the problem you're facing is fixed by some other, or there are ways in which people have done it like hundreds of years ago yeah. that might apply to you. Or other, other industry, for example, how did they fix it, right? So I do think having a diversity of opinion, including you know historical figures, yeah. absolutely helps. And yeah. I think, yeah, that, that's the way, I mean, for, for me, the, the book that I, I just described is... It's not like I want to, you know, think about how many bushels of wheat to bring with me if I ever <laughs> travel a camping across right. Persia. But it's it's the one thing is that you shouldn't forget about. You know, that's that's kind of you get in the mindset if you talk to your team and tell them that look, you know, yes, there's a vision, but you've got to be as meticulous as these guys did in planning yeah. phase to really make that a success. It's the one idea, right, mm-hmm. that you really changes your way of thinking. Yeah. And that's all the book does, right? I don't remember it off the top of my head all the books, how we did it. But what I do get out of it is that there's a lot of things that your mindset has to first set the vision, change your mindset towards executing that vision. Absolutely. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we're running out of time here because he's running for uh, he's, uh, for the airport soon. Uh, yes. Thanks so much today for coming here You're and joining me. And uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks uh, in our breast implant webinar. Looking forward to that. Thanks for having me, Jenny. Thank you, guys. See you later.